standing and turn to Matthew chapter 22. And in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus is confronted, we find Jesus being confronted by some religious people. Jesus for three years has been sharing, announcing uh, the kingdom of heaven, and these religious leaders don't believe him. These religious leaders uh, want him dead, and in just a few days, he will be hanging on a cross. And so Jesus, speaking to them that day, shared this parable with them. And we're going to learn today that from this parable that the most wonderful thing in your life is to be invited or welcomed in to the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 22, we're going to begin in verse 1. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Our world tells us that if you can only go to this destination and make sure you snap, uh, uh, take a um, Snapchat, take a selfie, this is wonderful, show all your friends, right? Uh, we hear in our culture that if you can just get this car or this possession, this item, make sure you take a snapshot, show all your friends, that it's wonderful. We're told, too, that if we could just get away, maybe with family and friends, and enjoy just time together, that that's just the most wonderful thing, and they take a snapshot. And those people that don't get to experience those things, don't get to buy those things, uh, sorry, you just miss out. Who are you? This life is all there is. Just try to get what you can. Today we're going to once again remind ourselves that there's a bigger story than our small little stories that's going on. It's a story of Jesus Christ and there is nothing more wonderful than, for you and for me than to be welcomed into his kingdom. So I'd like to share the parable and then talk about what that looks like in our lives. So let's begin again in verse one. Jesus spoke to them again in parables saying the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. A parable where is, is where something is likened to something else. And Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a wedding banquet. Now first, what does the kingdom of heaven like? Or what does it mean? It's used uh, 32 times in the Gospel of Matthew, and the equivalent is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God, is where... Jesus the King reigns and rules in people's hearts. And in extension, it's this community where he reigns. It's where Jesus reigns in your heart and mind. That's the kingdom of heaven, where his will is done. Now, Jesus, if you uh, note here, said the kingdom of heaven is like a wedding banquet. In the first century, nobody thought of it as a wedding banquet. At best, it was a courtroom. First century, 
being under the rule of God and going to be with God was like being in a courtroom. You kind of like did your very best and hoped to make it, and that you were good and you were righteous enough, and you would squeak in, and then all the bad people, you know, they'd just be obliterated. So the kingdom of heaven, it was like a courtroom. Notice Jesus doesn't say that, nor does he say the kingdom of heaven is like a lecture. How many of you would like to be on a journey towards a, a lecture? It doesn't say it's like a long meeting. I thought this week about... Um, uh, I was thinking of our students, but I thought of uh, growing up, I went on more than one field trip uh, in school that was boring. Any of you guys ever been on one of those? Right, you go to some conservation area and it's kind of rainy and dreary out and there's mosquitoes and oh, isn't this fun, right? That you're on this, the wedding kingdom of heaven is like, is like this long, boring field trip. No, he says the kingdom of heaven is like a wedding banquet. And a wedding banquet is talking about a wedding reception. It's the place where you have fun, where you celebrate, where there's joy, where there's love. Has anybody ever been to a wedding reception and it was fun, right? Anybody? Yeah, it's fun. You want to celebrate. Um, and usually, uh, you know, at, at that celebration, the, the couple are thinking, okay, what can we do to make it fun? And sometimes it's just low-key and not much. Sometimes it's more. But you're thinking, what, what is it that could would be really fun? Uh, I just came across this on the news a while ago, but um, how many of you like, well, you don't have to show your hand, but Mexican food, okay? If you like Mexican food and you're not yet married and you find somebody else that likes Mexican food, right? Here's a little um, information for you. Taco Bell restaurants have a wedding package where you can go to their flagship restaurant in Las Vegas and you get to have your wedding in their restaurant and there's a wedding package. And in the wedding package, you get different sauces, a few different things, and you get a 12 pack of tacos. There you go. And there's people that do that. <laughs> they like Mexican food. Okay, that's, they're having fun. My wife this week showed me a picture of uh, Pippa Middleton. Some of you know her, the sister of Duchess Kate, Kate the Duchess of Cambridge, right? It was a picture of her wedding reception, and it was a glass marquee, which I think was in her parents' backyard, and in this glass marquee, they had these huge, huge cherry blossom trees. It was beautiful. There was more flowers on one particular table than my wife's ever going to get in her life, I think. It was just a lot, right? <laughs> but they're thinking, wedding banquet, reception, what can make this fun? Jesus is telling us the kingdom of heaven coming under his rule, going to be with him forever, is not dreary. It's a place of joy and celebration. Now, notice this, though, that it's the king who does the inviting to the wedding banquet. Look at verse 3. He, the king, sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come. This presence of, of the king, this wedding banquet, his son, we don't just invite ourselves. We don't just earn our way there. We have to be invited. We are dead in our sins. None of us can just show up. So he has to do the inviting. But notice this. We, having been given the invitation, we have to respond to the king's invitation. Verse 3, he sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Come to the wedding banquet for my son. And they refused. Now, who's the they that Jesus is talking about? It's the ones he's facing uh, on the last, day of his, uh, last week of his life. It's the religious leaders. The Jewish, representing the Jewish people, they were the ones that were recipients of the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, you go down through the line. They were the ones that received the law. They received the temple. It was through their line that the Messiah was going to come. God blessed them so that they could be a blessing to the other nations, that God was going to use them so that they would invite everyone, non-Jews, to this wedding banquet. But these religious leaders refused to come. They didn't believe in Jesus. Now, in the first century, that was incon inconceivable. That was absurd. In the first century, 
If you were invited to a wedding banquet, it was on the pinnacle of your social calendar. Every day, if you look in history, you go back, it was a hard life in the first century, around the world, but uh, in the Middle East as well. It was a hard life, and every day they were under Roman oppression. They would eke out an existence. Can you imagine every day just going to work, just getting a little bit of money, and then making your food? That's it. You wake up, you go to work, you eat, have, you know, and then you do the same thing the next day. And a wedding banquet where someone is preparing this feast for you, I mean, you would never, ever refuse. And if it's the king, that's the opportunity of a lifetime. It would be a breach of courtesy, of, um, of, of social ethics. And they're like, that would never happen. And Jesus is saying, you've been invited, but you've refused. And notice the refused is not that they weren't able to come to the banquet, it's that they wouldn't come to the banquet. You see, going to the banquet, receiving the king's invitation, was saying, I want to be in your company. I want to be a friend of yours. The king was extending the invitation. You be my friend, and I'll be your friend. Let's be friends. Let's celebrate together. And they refused. Jesus continues, then he sent some more servants and said, tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. So he sends out more servants to these people and says, please come to the banquet. Look, it's going to be the most lavish banquet. This is going to be the banquet of all banquets, the gala of all galas. What do you think has been the most lavish wedding banquet or reception that we know in our world today. Can you think? Uh, Prince William and uh, Duchess Kate, they estimate that their wedding costs somewhere around $34 million. Somewhat lavish. <laughs> Prince Charles and Lady Diana Somewhere it's estimated between 50 and 100 million dollars. But probably the most lavish wedding reception was what took place not too long ago uh, with this couple in Moscow. The, the son was, uh, the guy was the son of uh, um, an oil and media tycoon. And so for this young couple, they got married in, in Moscow. Harper's Bazaar estimated their wedding reception to be a billion dollars. Now, let's just say that's a little, you know, exaggerated. Let's just say it was a few hundred million dollars, right? They, uh, they brought in furniture from Paris. They brought in uh, Julio Iglesias. Remember him? Sting. Jennifer Lopez all came in. They had a meal. It wasn't a buffet. No, no, no. This, they, oh, it was the finest foods. Everybody got this jewelry box. It was like, it was lavish. Now think, if you were invited to that, would you go? Hey, we'll fly you over there. Enjoy an opportunity of a lifetime. You might go. It might last a day. Maybe it's a two-day thing. Maybe if you're lucky, a week thing, and you just get to have fun. This banquet that Jesus is talking about is not lasting a day. It's lasting for all eternity. And the son is not the son of a tycoon. He's the son of God who owns everything. This banquet is the banquet of all banquets. But look at their response. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. In our world today, we put the invitation to come out to the wedding banquet, but there's certain countries in our world that said, you can't say that in our country, and if you do, we'll kill you. We'll seize the servants and we'll kill them. But not everybody is hostile to the invitation. We don't want to hear about this king and his son. Notice some of them were just indifferent, preoccupied with their own life. They don't need the king and his son. They're self-satisfied. Either way, they haven't responded to the king's invitation. We're not coming. Jesus says, the king sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned 
their city. And he's probably, Jesus in this parable is speaking to the judgment that was coming in AD 70 where the Romans came in and destroyed Jerusalem and burnt the temple to the ground. And it was just, it's, it was giving this idea or giving a picture of the idea that to reject the king's invitation is to invite judgment. That if you don't respond to the king's invitation, you're inviting judgment in your life. This week I uh, was listening to the news and they were talking about uh, missing and murdered by uh, indigenous women and estimates somewhere between 1,400 and 4,000. And I thought to myself as a parent, if one of my children went missing and I don't know if they were ever murdered or whatever became of them, that would grieve me. And I'm sure as you as parents and even single people that you know someone you love, it grieves you. And to think that that person who did that could get away with it. No, we're moral beings who say, no, no, no. The loving thing is to bring that person to justice. When we see people in our world that are committing fraud in the financial sector, I mean, robbing people of their investments and and their life savings, and some of them getting away with it. When we see people abusing people and hurting people, we say, a loving God would do something about that, and he is going to do something about it. But here's the reality. All of us here are under his judgment. We may not have killed someone, but we've all maybe lied to someone, or hurt someone, or done something that is wrong. We have what's called the imputed nature of Adam, the first human being, who sinned, we have that. And so all of us are invited to the banquet, but if we don't respond, we invite ourselves to judgment. Jesus continues, verse eight, then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. They didn't wanna come, they don't deserve to come. So go to the street corners, invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. And we learn here that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, isn't limited to just the Jewish people. That at that table, at that wedding banquet, there will be more than just Jewish people. Jesus spoke about that when he said, At the table will be Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the prophets, but there will be people coming from the east and west, north and south. That the invitation to salvation, to the banquet, is for everyone. It's for Asians, it's for Africans, it's for Latinos, it's for Caucasians. Did I miss anyone? Okay, it's for all people. That's why we have missions at Woodside. We are sending people out from our church to go to Ecuador or Rwanda or Zambia or Nigeria or Austria so that they can give the invitation out there. It's for all people uh, of all ethnicities. But notice here that it isn't just the kingdom of heaven, isn't just for good people. Notice the bad. They're there as well. The wedding hall was filled with guests, with good people and bad people. And in that day, That was absurd to a religious leader. A bad person being at this wedding banquet with the king, they don't deserve to be there. And they're right. The bad people don't deserve to be there, and the good people that appear to have it all together, they don't deserve to be there as well. You know, and we read in Scripture, Nicodemus, a really good guy that had it all together, he eventually came under the reign and rule of Jesus, gave his life to Jesus, Nicodemus will be at that table. And you know Joseph of Arimathea, another really good guy that had it all together, he still needed Jesus, bowed his knee to Jesus, he's going to be at the table. But can I tell you something? Mary Magdalene had a checkered past, and she's going to be at that table. Levi, whose name was changed to Matthew, who wrote the gospel we're reading about, he was a cheat. He took people's money and he's gonna be at that banquet table. There's gonna be a lot of people there you're thinking, why are you here? But in reality, we're gonna be looking around, why is anybody here? None of us deserve to be there. It's the grace of the king extending the invitation to us all. But Jesus doesn't end the parable there, he goes on. 
And he adds a little twist here. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. So they're all gathered to celebrate. Oh, the, you know, the wedding's taking place. Let's, weddings, we're going to celebrate here and have fun. They're all gathered together. And the king comes in and he sees all of these people wearing the wedding clothes except this one fellow. Now, in that day, in, it was an ancient custom that kings and, and wealthy people, when they threw a party or they threw a banquet, uh, they provided the guests with a robe with some attire, so they wouldn't have to wear uh, you know, clothing that didn't really fit the occasion. So they were all given something that they were to wear. And this fellow, knowing that he's required to wear that wedding garment, says, I'm not going to wear it. He willfully says, I'm not wearing it. And he, in a sense, was aligning himself with the others who refused to come to the banquet in the first place, and he was saying to the, to the king, I oppose you. You're really not my friend. Then in verse 13, we have again another statement of judgment. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the harder part of, of love where God has to judge our sin. But we see here that we're all held responsible for our sin. If we refuse to put on the wedding clothes, God has to judge us. God doesn't want to judge anyone. He's a God of love. But in his love, he has to judge sin. He has to judge the person that murdered that girl. He has to judge the person that lied to that person. And then Jesus ends the parable with this statement. For many are invited, but few are chosen. The invitation goes out to the many, but few are chosen. God chooses us. We choose him. We don't know how it all works together this side of eternity. But the reality is, is that people hear about the invitation, but there's few that respond to it. So I want to ask you this morning, what does that mean? What does this parable mean for you and for me? Well, first we have to ask ourselves, what is that wedding garment that Jesus speaks of in the parable that the bad and the good were wearing? Most scholars believe that it's what's called the imputed righteousness of Christ that comes to us through his death on the cross. Isaiah, looking ahead to what the Messiah would do, said this, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. That God, the King, he gives us this wedding garment to wear. It's a gift to us. Come to the wedding banquet and you get to wear this. And we have to make the decision, are we going to come? Are we going to put on that wedding garment? And Isaiah says that if we try to go to the banquet with our own self-righteousness, they're like filthy rags. Our self-righteousness is not good enough. You look at the Apostle Paul, who was a really good guy, but he, in his epistles, in particular Galatians, says that my self-righteousness, the self-righteousness of religious people like myself, it's not enough to be declared righteous with God. He said, I need the righteousness that is found in Jesus Christ, that I need to put on the garment of salvation. Have you put that on? Have you put that on? If you're here this morning, and maybe this is your first time at church, and this is the first time you're hearing about Jesus and the good news of Jesus. Let me just kind of summarize it quickly for you because God wants to speak to you this morning. And the good news of Jesus is this, is that God, our creator, made all of us here in his image. We are the pinnacle of his creation. God, in all of his creation, you look around, you are the pinnacle. You matter the most to him. And he made us in his image so that we could know him, love him, and obey him for all eternity. That's the good news. The bad news is, is that we have turned from that God. We have chosen to go our own way. And as a result of that, we experience the consequence. One consequence is that physically we die. All of us here, unless the Lord returns, we're all going to die physically. But we also experience, or are set to experience, spiritual death, where for all eternity we will be cut off, separate from this loving, holy God. 
But this God who made you and me loves us so much that he came to this world in Jesus, fully God and fully man. And Jesus, God in the flesh, lived a sinless life. And because of that, was able to meet the requirements of the law and stand in our stead, in our place, so that a holy God and all of his judgment that he has to do and he has to put upon a person is put on Christ. Jesus was, gets our imputed sin. But there on the cross, his sacrifice paid for our sin. And the third day, he rose again, proving that he is the Son of God, proving that sin and death does not have the last word in our existence. And he appeared to his first followers, and he said to them, he said, now go and take this good news to all nations. Invite everybody to come to the wedding banquet. And so here we are 2,000 years later. Hear the words of Jesus. Come to the wedding banquet. I want to pause for a moment and remind ourselves of why God sent Jesus to die for us so that we could wear this wedding garment. Jesus says it this way, for God so loved you that he gave his only son, that if you believe in him, you will not perish, but will have eternal life. Paul said it this way, but God did way. And as a result of that, we experience the consequence. One consequence is that physically we die. All of us here, unless the Lord returns, we're all going to die physically. But we also experience, or or, are set to experience, spiritual death, where for all eternity, we will be cut off, separate from this loving, holy God. But this God who made you and me loves us so much that he came to this world in Jesus fully God and fully man. And Jesus, God in the flesh, lived a sinless life. And because of that, was able to meet the requirements of the law and stand in our stead, in our place, so that a holy God and all of his judgment that he has to do and he has to put upon a person is put on Christ. Jesus gets our imputed sin. But there on the cross, His sacrifice paid for our sins. And the third day, he rose again, proving that he is the Son of God, proving that sin and death does not have the last word in our existence. And he appeared to his first followers, and he said to them, he said, now go and take this good news to all nations. Invite everybody to come to the wedding banquet. And so here we are 2,000 years later, Hear the words of Jesus. Come to the wedding banquet. I want to pause for a moment and remind ourselves of why God sent Jesus to die for us so that we could wear this wedding garment. Jesus says it this way, for God so loved you that he gave his only son that if you believe in him, you will not perish but will have eternal life. Paul said it this way, but God demonstrates his own love for us, for you, in that while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. John said it this way, this is love, not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for us, for you. And when you can come to grips with this bigger story, that the most wonderful thing in your life is not going here, buying this, doing this, experiencing this. The most wonderful thing is that you get to come into a relationship with God Almighty in the person of Jesus Christ that changes everything in your life. And if you are going to live the life that God has called you to live, you have to journey through life knowing you're going to a wedding banquet, knowing your future, but you journey through life flooding your soul with that reality. We live in a culture that doesn't speak about a bigger story, but you have to choose and say, I'm going to get this, the words of Jesus in my life. Here's just a one, um, had a takeaway I was hoping you'd get this morning. It's this, as you journey through life, never ever lose your sense of awe 
that God loves you. Today, God doesn't love you with an imperfect love. He loves you with a perfect love. He can't love you more. He can't love you less. He loves you perfectly. The way he loved you yesterday is the way that he'll love you tomorrow. But here's the challenge. When we go through life, sometimes we feel that God doesn't love us or that we are unlovable. And so we think, well, I, you know, I'm an unlovable person. God must think that of me. Or that person over there, they think of me that way, so God must think of me that way. The reality is, is that God loves you. And every day, we need to remind ourselves of that truth. Every day, bring our minds back to what he did for us on the cross. I mentioned last week uh, doing the funeral of uh, someone in our church, an older lady but, uh, there, but I want to just mention another funeral of an older lady in our church um, two weeks ago that, uh, that I was at. And you know at a funeral you talk about the person, right? And so we were talking about this lady in our church, and we made the statement to her family, and then I echoed it, is that she loved God. She loved her family. She loved people. But there was something more about her. She was secure in God's love for her. Did you get that? Are you secure in God's love for you? She had ups and downs in her life, but she wasn't the person that, you know, picks the flower. God loves me, God loves me not. No, no. She went to the Word of God. She had embraced it. She knew it, and so she brought that to mind. And she went through life secure in God's love for her. I want to just quickly pause for a moment and share three things from Romans 8 that you can embrace so that you can journey through life secure. And if you haven't memorized these verses, I would encourage you to memorize them. The first one is this, is that this God who loves you is a God of forgiveness. We read in Romans 8, that therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That if you are in Jesus, you belong to him. You've received him. There's no condemnation. There's no future judgment. And so you get to go through life knowing that you've done things wrong and you try to make amends where you can with people, but you go through life not thinking, oh my goodness, what do I got to do to make sure God still loves me? And okay, I got to, you know, do this good work and I got to perform this um, ritual and I have to make this sacrifice and I'm, I'm trying to get it back to you, God. You know, please love me. No. Shame, guilt, all of that stuff. You throw it off and you say, I have no condemnation because he did that for me. We have a God of forgiveness. We also have a God of hope. We read and we know that in all things, God works for good, together for good, to those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. We have a God who has said to us, in all the things you're going through in life right now, I don't want you getting mad at that person and bitter at that person and getting upset and going and living in despair. I want you to know that in the end, there's coming a day where I am at work now, and one day, all of those things that are happened, people have done against you, or all the mistakes you've made, all of those things, I will set right. One day, you will look back, and you will be able to say, God, I didn't understand it, but I give you glory and praise. Do you know that? That you have a future ahead of you. You go through life, and you're like, why did this have to happen to me, or why am I like this, or that... You go through life saying, God, I don't understand this, and I wish this was different, but I praise you that one day you will set all things right in my life. And then third, you have a God of faithful love. Paul said in Romans 8, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? And he responds, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That it is impossible for something to separate you from God's love. That's profound. It changes your life. I want to ask you, are you going through life loving people and loving God and loving your family, but you're secure in God's love for 
you. Parents, I want to just remind you, you want the best for your kids. The best thing you can do for your kids is to lift up this God of love. Lift up Jesus. Help them to learn those stories about him in the Bible. Oh, look at how Jesus loved people. Oh, look at how Jesus was merciful for, for to people, how he forgave people. Look at Jesus and his power over, or, over the elements, over nature. Look at this Jesus, because the, in the end, that's the one they're going to stand before. Don't chase stuff of this world. Oh, this is wonderful. This is wonderful. If God allows you to go through something wonderful, great. But the most wonderful thing is to be invited into the kingdom of heaven. What is your response to the king's invitation? I'm going to invite you uh, now to take out your invitation, and if you would just open it up. Just wanted to put something tangible in your hands. And if you're disappointed that there's no chocolate inside, okay, there's a lot more coming your way. You are invited to true life, real life, eternal life, and you have to RSVP Jesus. There's some questions here that I hope uh, that you will look at this week, just as a reminder of today's message and the wedding banquet. But the first one is this, have you responded to King Jesus' invitation to his wedding banquet? Are you this morning wearing the wedding garment, your wedding clothes, where you say, Jesus, I'm not good enough to go to the banquet. I need you to save me from my sins. Forgive me my sins and come into my life and begin to change me. I want to follow you. If you have trusted Christ as your Savior, you are on your way to the wedding banquet. If you're here this morning and you've never done that, today you can call out to Jesus and ask him to save you. And Today it can be your day of salvation and you can begin your journey. In just a moment, we're going to come to the table where we take this bread reminding us that Jesus died on a cross for us, the bread representing his body, and we're going to drink the cup representing the blood that Jesus shed for us. But here's, here's really the mind-boggling thing, is that, is that Jesus meets us at this table, and not one of us here deserves to be at this table. And yet, because of his love for you and for me, he says, come. And if you haven't come to Jesus today, you can. And you can remember what he did on the cross for you. It is so humbling. None of us here, as we come to this table, have this attitude, I'm better than other people, and that's why I'm going where I'm going. No, all of us are on our knees with grateful hearts saying, I don't deserve to be there. Thank you, Jesus, that I will be there. This table speaks of a future table, the wedding supper of the Lamb, where we will be united with Jesus for all eternity. And we will celebrate. If you're married today, that's wonderful, but please remind, remind yourself uh, your marriage is not to be idolized. It's not the end. We all are born single, and we're to die single. If you're single here today, we affirm you. It's okay to be single. All of us who know Jesus one day will be united with him. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 5 puts it this way. You know when a husband and wife get married and they do this and this and that? It's a picture of that when we will be united with Jesus. The celebration with this wedding is just a little glimpse of that celebration and that wedding. Would you join with me as we pray? And if you'd rather not this morning... Take the bread and the cup, just pass it along. But if you have said yes to Jesus and his invitation, you're welcome to meet him this morning. Heavenly Father, we confess that we live in a world of culture where having a relationship with you is not the most wonderful thing in the world. But in reality, it is. And we thank you that you have made it possible through your son Jesus for us to be with you. So now as we take the bread, we give thanks for it. As we take the cup, we give thanks for it as well with humble hearts and with grateful hearts. And we pray this in your son's name.
Amen. Thank you.